Mary Shelley, The Short Stories. Born in 1797, her mother died when she was only 11 days old. Mary was then raised by her father, who remarried when she was four, with a liberal but informal upbringing. At 17, she began the relationship with the poet Percy Bysshe Shelley, which was the bedrock of her life, although society viewed the unmarried somewhat differently. It was in this relationship that she nurtured and edited Shelley's verse and wrote, at 21, her signature work, Frankenstein, for which she is so well known. Her husband drowned when she was 25, which added further to the earlier loss of three of her four children. Beset with such great tragedy, at only 53, a brain tumour was to take her own life. In this volume, we turn our attention to her short stories, which creep with menace and view the world with a very suspicious eye. Our stories are read for you by Gazella Rowe and Richard Midgley. The Mourner by Mary Shelley One fatal remembrance, one sorrow that throws its bleak shade alike o'er our joys and our woes, to which life nothing darker or brighter can bring, for which joy has no balm and affliction no sting. A gorgeous scene of kingly pride is the prospect now before us. The offspring of art, the nursling of nature, where can the eye rest on a landscape more deliciously lovely than the fair expanse of Virginia water, now an open mirror to the sky, now shaded by umbrageous banks which wind into dark recesses or are rounded into soft promontories? Looking down on it, now that the sun is low in the west, the eye is dazzled, the soul oppressed by excess of beauty. Earth Water, air, drink to overflowing the radiance that streams from yonder well of light. The foliage of the trees seems dripping with the golden flood, while the lake, filled with no earthly dew, appears but an embasoning of the sun-tinctured atmosphere, and trees and gay pavilion float in its depths, more clear, more distinct than their twins in the upper air. Nor is the scene silent. Strains more sweet than those that lull Venus to her balmy rest, more inspiring than the song of Tiresias, which awoke Alexander to the deed of ruin, more solemn than the chantings of Saint Cecilia, float along the waves and mingle with the lagging breeze which ruffles not the lake. Strange that a few dark scores should be the key to this fountain of sound, the unconscious link between unregarded noise and harmonies which unclose paradise to our entranced senses. The sun touches the extreme boundary, and a softer, milder light mingles a rosate tinge with the fiery glow. Our boat has floated long on the broad expanse. Now let it approach the umbrageous bank. The green tresses of the graceful willow dip into the waters, which are checked by them into a ripple. The startled teal dart from their recess, skimming the waves with splashing wing. The stately swans float onward, while innumerable waterfowl cluster together out of the way of the oars. The twilight is blotted by no dark shades. It is one subdued, equal receding of the great tide of day, which leaves the shingles bare but not deformed. We may disembark, and wander yet amid the glades, long before the thickening shadows speak of night. The plantations are formed of every English tree, with an old oak or two standing out in the walks. There the glancing foliage obscures heaven as the silken texture of a veil, a woman's lovely features. Beneath such fretwork we may indulge in light-hearted thoughts, or, if sadder meditations lead us to seek darker shades, we may pass the cascade towards the large groves of pine with their vast undergrowth of laurel, reaching up to the belvedere. Or, on the opposite side of the water, sit under the shadow of the silver-stemmed birch, or beneath the leafy pavilions of those fine old beeches, whose high fantastic roots seemed formed in nature's sport. And the near jungle of sweet-smelling marica leaves no sense unvisited by pleasant ministration. Now this splendid scene is reserved for the royal possessor, but in past years, while the lodge was called the regent's cottage, or before, when the under-ranger inhabited it, the mazy paths of Chapel Wood were open, 
and the iron gates enclosing the plantations and Virginia water were guarded by no Cerberus untamable by sops. It was here, on a summer's evening, that Horace Neville and his two fair cousins floated idly on the placid lake. In that sweet mood when pleasant thoughts bring sad thoughts to the mind. Neville had been eloquent in praise of English scenery. In distant climes, he said, we may find landscapes grand in barbaric wildness, or rich in the luxuriant vegetation of the south, or sublime in alpine magnificence. We may lament, though it is ungrateful to say so on such a night as this, the want of a more genial sky. But where find scenery to be compared to the verdant, well-wooded, well-watered groves of our native land? the clustering cottages, shadowed by fine old elms, each garden blooming with early flowers, each lattice gay with geraniums and roses, the blue-eyed child devouring his white bread while he drives a cow to graze, the hedge redolent with summer blooms, the enclosed cornfields, seas of golden grain weltering in the breeze, the stile, the track across the meadow, leading through the copse under which the path winds, and the meeting branches overhead, which give by their dim tracery a cathedral-like solemnity to the scene. The river, winding with sweet inland murmur, and, as additional graces, spots like these, oases of taste, gardens of Eden, the works of wealth which evince at once the greatest power and the greatest will to create beauty. And yet, continued Neville, it was with difficulty that I persuaded myself to reap the best fruits of my uncle's will, and to inhabit this spot, familiar to my boyhood, associated with unavailing regrets and recollected pain. Horace Neville was a man of birth, of wealth, but he could hardly be termed a man of the world. There was in his nature a gentleness, a sweetness, a winning sensibility, allied to talent and personal distinction that gave weight to his simplest expressions and excited sympathy for all his emotions. His younger cousin, his junior by several years, was attached to him by the tenderest sentiments, secret long, but they were now betrothed to each other, a lovely, happy pair. She looked inquiringly, but he turned away. No more of this, he said, and giving a swifter impulse to their boat, they speedily reached the shore, landed, and walked through the long extent of Chapel Wood. It was dark night before they met their carriage at Bishopsgate. A week or two later, Horace received letters to call him to a distant part of the country. It even seemed possible that he might be obliged to visit an estate in the north of Ireland. A few days before his departure, he requested his cousin to walk with him. They bent their steps across the several meadows to Old Windsor Churchyard. At first he did not deviate from the usual path, and as they went they talked cheerfully, gaily. The beauteous sunny day might well exhilarate them. The dancing waves sped onwards at their feet. The country church lifted its rustic spire into the bright pure sky. There was nothing in their conversation that could induce his cousin to think that Neville had led her hither for any saddening purpose. But when they were about to quit the churchyard, Horace, as if he had suddenly recollected himself, turned from the path, crossed the greensward, and paused beside a grave near the river. No stone was there to commemorate the being who reposed beneath. It was thickly grown with rich grass, starred by a luxuriant growth of humble daisies. A few dead leaves, a broken bramble twig, defaced its neatness. Neville removed these, and then said, Juliet, I commit this sacred spot to your keeping while I am away. There is no monument, he continued, for her commands were implicitly obeyed by the two beings to whom she addressed them. One day another may lie near, and his name will be her epitaph. I do not mean myself, he said, half smiling at the terror his cousin's countenance expressed, but promise me, Juliet, to preserve this grave from every violation. I do not wish to sadden you by the story. Yet if I have excited your curiosity, your interest, I should say, I will satisfy it, but not now, not here. Leaving the churchyard, they found their horses in attendance, and they prolonged their ride across Bishopsgate Heath. 
Neville's mind was full of the events to which he had alluded. He began the tale, and then abruptly broke off. It was not till the following day, when in company with her sister they again visited Virginia Water, that, seated under the shadow of its pines, whose melodious swinging in the wind breathed unearthly harmony, and looking down upon the water, association of place and its extreme beauty reviving yet soothing the recollections of the past unasked by his companions, Neville at once commenced his story. I was sent to Eton at eleven years of age. I will not dwell upon my sufferings there. I would hardly refer to them, did they not make a part of my present narration. 